Good afternoon. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs. The hearing entitled National Security Implications of U.S. Policy Toward Cuba will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee and the Ranking Member of the Full Committee be allowed to make opening statements without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent uh, that Mr. Delahunt and well, let's see, Mr. Cooper and Ms. Richardson all be uh, allowed to participate in this hearing. In accordance with the committee rules, they will uh, only be allowed to question the witnesses after all official members of the subcommittee have had their turn first. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Without objection, that's so ordered as well. Uh, first, let me thank all of you for your patience and forbearance. Uh, we have, you know, the stir of the best laid plans of mice and men. Uh, always go astray, and, and of course they time the voting just at the beginning of this hearing, so 25 minutes has, has gone by, and uh, we regret that and apologize for any inconvenience it's made for our witnesses. We surely do appreciate all the help you've given us in providing your written statements in advance, as well as your willingness and, uh, to testify here today. Uh, at the outset of this hearing, I want to recognize the leadership that the ranking member Flake has shown uh, on this uh, very important issue. He's been recognized uh, as one of the leaders on this issue. He's recognized the need for advancement of America's thinking on the subject, and he's been a principal sponsor of major related legislation together with our Massachusetts colleague, Bill Delahunt. So thank you for your leadership on this. President Obama's April 13 announcement lifting restrictions on family visits and remittances to Cuba, I believe, is a step in the right direction. I hope it's the first step in a long journey. Indeed, the President left open the door to further changes when he stated, we also believe that Cuba can potentially be a critical part of regional growth. The current U.S. policy toward Cuba is anachronistic and unsustainable, and it's a source of contention between the United States and the rest of Latin America, as well as the European Union. In the lead-up to the recent fifth summit of the Americas in Trinidad and Tobago, the Costa Rican newspaper La Nación observed that all of Latin America is asking for an end to Cuba's isolation. In today's hearing, the subcommittee aims to identify concrete ways in which increased United States-Cuba cooperation is in our own national security interest, ways that could support the safety and security of the United States citizens, and the nature of the threat the United States would face should our interaction stagnate or lessen. The United States and Cuba have many shared concerns and a long history of shared collaboration, such as joint medical research that predates the Spanish-American War, so-called fence talks between Cuban and American soldiers on Guantanamo, overflights by U.S. hurricane hunters to predict extreme weather, and piecemeal partnerships between our Coast Guards. Most of this cooperation requires nothing more than political will to implement it. Increased cooperation in these fields could give political leaders in both countries the confidence they need to end the 50-year era of mistrust. On April 13, 2009, a letter from 12 retired generals and admirals to President Obama gave a persuasive agreement, an argument, I should say, for greater United States-Cuba engagement. It stated as follows. Cuba ceased to be a military threat decades ago. At the same time, Cuba has intensified its global, diplomatic, and economic relations with natures as diverse as China, Russia, Venezuela, Brazil, and members of the European Union. Even worse, the embargo inspired a significant diplomatic movement against U.S. policy when world leaders overwhelmingly cast their vote in the United Nations against the embargo and then visited Havana to denounce American policy. It's time to change the policy, especially after 50 years of failure in attaining our goals. These generals and admirals recommend, and I quote, renewed engagement with Havana on key security issues such as narcotics trafficking, immigration, airspace, and Caribbean security. This idea of engagement underlies our current policies in Iran, Syria, and North Korea, all much graver concerns to the United States where Americans are currently free to travel. Experts generally agree that the United States national security would be strengthened if Cuba pursued alternatives to Venezuela or Russian influence. Increasing energy trade with Cuba would contribute to the United States energy security and would create competition with the export-oriented populist agenda of Venezuela leader Hugo Chavez, while dampening Venezuela's efforts to strengthen its regional presence through visible aid to Cuba. The United States energy trade could also limit the attractiveness of the more assertive foreign policy of Russia and China's increased presence in Latin America and investment in Cuba's energy segment. 
Cuba's strategic location and its apparent seriousness of purpose in fighting drugs is another strong argument for comprehensive U.S.-Cuban cooperation. Closer coordination could also help close off trafficking routes in the Western Caribbean and disrupt ongoing operations of South American cocaine mafias. Equally important, Cuba's evacuation plans, post-disaster medical support, and advanced citizen preparedness education programs are well worth studying. More than 1,600 Americans died during Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and the United States' death toll from Hurricane Ike in 2008 came close to 100. Cuba's death rate from storms over the same period, in contrast, was only about three people per year. Only seven Cubans died from Hurricane Ike. Hurricane preparedness is one of the few areas where the United States and Cuba actually do talk to one another. The United States National Hurricane Center has a good working relationship with its Cuban counterpart, and hurricane hunters based in the United States regularly cross Cuban's airspace with its government's permission. However, other forms of cooperation with Cuba and hurricane response are nearly non-existent. An open exchange of knowledge and transfer of technologies could save lives. All these factors then lead us to the inevitable conclusion that talking to Cuba is in our own interest as well as in Cuba's interest. Our expert witnesses today will detail some steps we should be taking. President Obama has taken an important first step. Now let's explore how and when we can go further and do better. At this point, I'd like to yield to Mr. Flake for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start by thanking you and the staff uh, for uh, the bipartisan manner in which this uh, hearing was prepared. And uh, thank the witnesses. This is a, a great group. I know uh, almost all of you or all of you. And uh, I look forward to the testimony and sorry for holding you up. Uh, I'll, I'll be short here. Um, as we know, the purpose of this hearing is to review national security implications of our current, current policy to Cuba. There is no denying, I think, by anybody that our current policy toward Cuba has failed to achieve the bipartisan goal of uh, regime change. Instead, our policy of isolation has turned the island into what retired General Charles Wilhelm has called a 47,000 square mile blind spot in our security rearview mirror. We have little to show for this policy but restrictions on the freedom of Americans and tense regional relations. While I have no sympathy for the Castro regime, my views on the appropriate direction of U.S. Uh, Cuba policy are well known. I support ending the trade embargo, which has given the U.S. a needless black eye in the region for far too long without any gains. Along with many in the Cuban-American community, I also support lifting of the travel ban for all Americans, uh, our best ambassadors for democracy. I congratulate the administration on the recent removal of restrictions on Cuban American travel and, and remittances. And I also welcome their willingness to review our current approach to the island, uh, perhaps a subject of a future subcommittee hearing, Mr. Chairman. However, I'm also concerned about the continued emphasis on reciprocity with respect to changes in U.S. Cuban relations. Rather than allowing the Cuban government to control the pace and nature of our bilateral relations, I've long felt that the U.S. must act in a manner consistent with our own self-interest, independent of the politics and whims of a foreign leader. Given the recent emphasis on U.S.-Cuban relations, both domestically and within the region, I welcome the opportunity presented by this hearing to answer important questions such as, are there national security liabilities associated with our policy of isolation? Uh, given the lack of results of the current approach, are, there are these liabilities justified? Now, independent of the imminent shift in U.S.-Cuba relations, there are, are there bilateral steps that can be taken that will improve U.S. national security? Again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding this hearing and look forward to the testimony. Thank you for your remarks. Now, the subcommittee will now receive the testimony of the panel that's before us here today. It's right here. Oh, you came in? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Realize that we'd like to give Mr. Issa, the chairman of the full, uh, the ranking member of the full committee, the opportunity to provide an opening rem uh, remarks as well. Uh, and so, uh, please, Mr. Issa, will proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And chairman in waiting is always a good title for a ranking member. <laughs> as long as you wait a long time, it's okay. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll I'll be appropriately patient. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. I want to take this opportunity to consider the debate on this very important matter and to provide some, some alternate thinking, but not to the extent that some might uh, consider. I do agree that we need to review our policy with all of the world's nations, including Cuba, on a regular basis. 
I believe that this administration, like all administrations, does need to carefully analyze the policies longstanding of previous administrations. I certainly, for example, would hope that very shortly the Taiwan Straits question be answered in the way that it has best been answered since at least Richard Nixon. But in the case of the 50 years since Fidel Castro toppled a corrupt government and replaced it with his own tyrannical regime, this true communist, the, both Fidel and Raul, have retained their power by stifling any and all dissent. They have imprisoned those who tried to open Cuban society and have murdered political opponents all the while the Cuban people have suffered from a failed economic conditions and imposed communism. We're not debating that here today. What I believe we are debating is how to best deal with a regime which is best described as the Castro brothers, now in the last years of their lives, Fidel no longer running the government on a day-to-day -day basis, but clearly still having some role in the decision process. The airwaves are still not free in Castro's Cuba and will not be as long as they remain in power. But they cannot remain past the clock that God gives them. So whether we see Hugo Chavez's influence in Cuba or North Korea's or Russia's, there will be a change. I welcome the opportunity today to consider when that time comes, a little before or a little after, being prepared to engage in positive dialogue with the people of Cuba, being able to end what since 1962 has been a blight on the Americas with a failed state, failed not just because economically it fails, but because it fails to give its own people, some of the best, the brightest, and most ambitious, the opportunities they so dearly seek. In short, Castro government is coming to an end, and we do need to consider today what to do when it ends. Having said that, I believe the United States owes no apology to, to standing up against Cuba and its government for many years. And I continue to believe that we must be prepared if we cannot reach effective transition for the Cuban people, we must be prepared to stand up to them as we stand up to North Korea. I do note by both the chairman and the ranking uh, member of the subcommittee that we do have travel of Americans to many countries. For example, China, which spies on us more than any other nation on earth and which is building a world-class navy and military and which has already shown an ability to shoot down a satellite and has certainly made it clear that that is not uh, only their own satellite that could be shot down is a place in which Americans travel and Chinese students come here. So, Mr. Chairman, this is a mixed opening statement for a reason. I want to hear what people have to say. I want to try to reconcile the good policy of many years with the future policy that may be an opportunity for the American people to engage at the right time. Last but not least, I would like to uh, uh, make it clear that when it comes to uh, General McCaffrey and the question of drugs, I stand with all those who want to utilize every tool at, at our disposal to stop drugs. I must, however, note that uh, any relationship with uh, Castro's Cuba would have to begin to look at the, the head of their own Navy who stands accused of drug trafficking in this country and has not been brought to, uh, to task for that and other similar situations in which it is believed that Castro's Cuba may in fact be part of the problem and not part of the solution. So, Chairman, I thank you very much for calling this uh, hearing. Thank you for your comments. Now the subcommittee will receive testimony from the panel before us here today. Uh, I'll introduce all of them and then ask uh, for comments starting at my left and moving across. Uh, general Barry McCaffrey is a retired four-star general and a 32-year veteran of the United States Army during which he served as commander of the United States Southern Command, or Southcom. For five years after leaving the military, General McCaffrey served as the nation's cabinet officer in charge of U.S. drug policy. After leaving government service, General McCaffrey served from 2001 to 2005 
as the Bradley Distinguished Professor of International Security Studies at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He continues as an adjunct professor of international affairs. He holds a B.S. from West Point and an M.A. from American University and told me earlier he's a Massachusetts native, and that always counts for, for extra points here. Mr. Jorge Pinon is an energy fellow from the University of Miami Center for Hemispheric Policy. Prior to his current position, he held a variety of senior positions in the energy sector, including President and CEO of Transworld Oil USA, President of Amico, Corporate Development Company Latin America, President of Amico Oil of Mexico, and President of Amico Oil Latin America, based in Mexico City. Mr. Pinon also currently serves as an advisor and a member of the Cuba Task Forces at the Brookings Institution institution and the Council of the Americas. Dr. Renz Lee is president of Global Advisory Services, a McLean, Virginia-based consulting firm. From 2002 to 2003, Dr. Lee worked as a research analyst at the Congressional Research Service. Dr. Lee has performed overseas contract assignments for the State Department, the Department of Energy, the World Bank, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, and other agencies. These assignments have covered Russia, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, the Caribbean, and much of South America. He is currently writing a book on drugs, organized crime, and the politics of democratic transition in Cuba. Dr. Lee holds a PhD from Stanford University. Mr. Philip Peters serves as Vice President of the Lexington Institute, where he has responsibility for international economic programs with a focus on Latin America. Prior to joining the Lexington Institute, Mr. Peters served in the State Department under Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, and has also served as a senior aide in the House of Representatives. Mr. Peters is an advisor to the Cuba Working Group that formed in January 2002 in the House of Representatives. Mr. Peters holds both a BA and an MA from Georgetown University. Ms. Sarah Stevens is the Executive Director of the Center for Democracy in the Americas. A longtime human rights advocate, Ms. Stevens began her work with Central American refugees in Los Angeles in the 1980s and has since held a number of human rights and civil rights organizations. From 2001 to 2006, Ms. Stevens worked for the Center for International Policy before leaving to launch the Center for Democracy in the Americas. Ms. Stevens has also led dozens of delegations of United States policymakers, academics, experts, and philanthropists to Cuba, Chile, and Venezuela in a fact-finding and research missions. Thank you all again for taking your time, making yourselves available today, and sharing your expertise. It's the policy of this subcommittee to swear you in before you testify, so I ask you to please stand and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. The record will please reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I remind all of you that your full written statement will be put in the hearing record. Uh, we ask you to try to keep your remarks to roughly within five minutes. Most of you are familiar with the lights. At the, uh, with one minute left, the amber light will come on. And when the five minutes is up, the red light will go off. And uh, we'll try to ask you at that point in time to wind down a little bit on that. So again, thank you. Uh, General McCaffrey, would you care to start? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to uh, Congressman Flake also and the members of the committee for the opportunity to be here. I'm also very impressed by the uh, other members of the panel and look forward to hearing their own testimony. And I thank you for uh, introducing into the record my own comments, which I wrote in consultation with uh, a bunch of people whose uh, judgment I have respect for. Uh, let me, if I can, uh, whenever you talk about Cuba, uh, there are such powerful um, animosities among the political agendas of those discussing the situations. They always try and set the baseline on what I actually think about Cuba. And there's qu six quick observations, one of which is I understand Cuba as a failing Marxist dictatorship. Uh, secondly, that it's locked in a revolution uh, that essentially since 1962 has had some difficulty adapting to the globalization and the movement of the world around them. Uh, third, that their economy is a disaster. And in the short term, uh, they're being propped up by Venezuelan oil and, and dollars out of the Chavez regime. Uh, but their bigger problem is they're running an artificial, uh, centralized, under-resourced uh, economy uh, where the true creative spirit of the Cuban people have been suppressed. Uh, fourth, I understand there's no freedom of assembly, speech, press, unions, where to live, no real choices. And when you see a lot of these refugees coming out of Cuba, it's not just economic opportunity in Florida or Louisiana or Mississippi or Texas uh, they're seeking. They're looking for freedom, the same reasons our uh, grandparents uh, came here. Fifth observation, uh, 
At the end of the day, the real power in Cuba is unquestionably held in the hands of the two uh, Castro brothers. Uh, and indeed, I think Fidel recently has stepped upon uh, Raul Castro's sort of grudging attempts to expand the nature of the debate. Uh, behind the power of the uh, Castro brothers is the Army and the Interior Ministry. There are six three-star generals and one four-star general in the Cuban military, Raul being the four-star general. The, all seven of them are in their late 60s or 70s. They will be gone along with much of the leadership of Cuba in the coming five years. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think uh, when you look at the current Cuban leadership, to some extent, you're looking at the Soviet Union in the 1980s. It's the calm before the storm. And the question is, what do we do in the first term of the Obama administration to make this thing come out better? Mr. Uh, Congressman Flake, I think, uh, said it in a very different way, uh, and I agree with his comment. That to some extent, U.S. policy has failed, and we've left U.S. policy in the hands of the Cubans. Uh, it's a very interesting dilemma. Uh, uh, there's no question we lack influence. When I was down, I spent 12 hours with the Castro brothers, um, uh, is acting as a professor at West Point uh, on a visit a couple years after 9-11. It was clear to me that uh, my subsequent dialogue with the 40-somethings of the Cuban government, they're smart young people out there. They're bilingual. They've traveled. Uh, they have ideas. And we don't know who they are, and we're not engaged with them. Uh, we've truncated and minimized uh, our access to that, uh, that regime. Um, the, um, another observation, if I may, uh, it seems to me unquestionable that Cuba is of little threat to U.S. national interests, certainly uh, U.S. national security interests. There also, I think this is a problem, of modest importance to U.S. foreign policy goals. In fact, uh, although the Cubans wake up in the morning thinking about little else than the injustice and the opportunity the United States represents to them. Uh, on, the, on the contrary, in the United States, I don't think we give it a, a, one bit of thought. Uh, it just has not been central to our concerns, even in the Caribbean region, where we've seen other actors with energy and leadership playing such a dramatic role, certainly including Puerto Rico uh, as, a, as a, a prime mover of modernization in the region. Um, I think uh, that uh, at the end of the day, the saddest comment I would make is I think the Cuban uh, leadership is stuck. I cannot imagine uh, uh, Fidel Castro or Raul, in fact, relenting uh, and negotiating away some aspects of the revolution. They're not going to do it. Uh, I think they're worried about their families, their place in history. Uh, they understand the time clock is running out on them. And I say that because I worry that the Obama administration, which has done uh, some, I think, incredibly smart things, sort of opening the, uh, the dialogue, uh, acting in such a gracious and uh, open manner at Trinidad, Tobago, going to Mexico, sending the Secretary of State to the region, uh, eliminating some restrictions on travel and remittances. Uh, having said that, I think they'll be under great pressure to explain changes in terms of rep reciprocity. What did we get back from them? Did they release 300 political prisoners <coughs> in return for something we do? I don't think they're going to do anything for us. And indeed, I would disengage U.S. foreign policy from trying to get something back in the coming year or two. Uh, there's three obvious things we ought to do. Uh, one of them has been mentioned uh, already. We ought to lift the economic embargo and allow American citizens free transit to Cuba. Uh, I think that will be the uh, greatest benefit to Cuban people imaginable uh, in terms of economic opportunity, new ideas, products, uh, political thinking. Secondly, we ought to formalize coordination on law enforcement institutions between the Cuban government and the American government. I actually hadn't heard of the accusation against the Navy chief. Uh, it's probably not uh, central. I do not believe the Cuban government is part of an international conspiracy on drug uh, smuggling. I think there's remnants of communist morality there. They're worried about their own kids. They've got lots of drugs floating around Cuba uh, that are causing problems among their own young people and corrupting their own institutions of government. But we ought to cooperate not just on drugs, but also human smuggling and other international uh, concerns such as terrorism. And then finally, it seems to me the U.S. government ought to end opposition to Cuban participation in Western Hemisphere multinational fora.
uh, to include the Organization of American States, some of the Americas, et cetera. Through engagement, we can move this process along. We're going to have a terrible challenge in Cuba. You know, I liken it to East Germany. Uh, that uh, problem uh, took a generation to begin to solve. Uh, and I, I think the same thing is going to happen in Cuba. So I'm all for uh, dramatic, sudden initiatives on the part of the uh, Obama administration uh, to directly engage the Cubans. Thanks very much for allowing me to offer these ideas, and I look forward to responding to your own interests. Thank you, General. We appreciate your remarks. Uh, Mr. Pinon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nearly two years ago, under the auspices of the Brookings Institution, I was invited to be part of a group of 19 distinguished academics, opinion leaders, and international diplomats committed in seeking a strong and effective U.S. policy toward Cuba. Under the leadership of Ambassador Carlos Pascual and Ambassador Vicky Huddleston, a team of well-known experts in the field of U.S.-Cuba relations carried out a series of simulation exercises and discussions that have served to enhance our understanding of the complex political realities of Cuba and the United States. By testing the responses of several strategic actors and stakeholders to a variety of scenarios, we have identified potential catalysts and constraints to political change on the island. The end result of our effort was a roadmap report entitled Cuba, a new policy of critical and constructive engagement, which I believe the committee has a copy of. Two thirds of Cuba's petroleum demand currently relies on imports and Venezuela is the single source of these imports under heavily subsidized payment terms. This petroleum dependency value at over $3 billion in 2008 could be used by Venezuela as a tool to influence a Cuban government in maintaining a politically antagonistic and belligerent position toward the United States. Cuba has learned from past experiences and is very much aware of the political and economic risk and consequences of depending on a single source of imported oil. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the 2003 Venezuelan oil strike taught Cuba very expensive lessons. Raul Castro understands the risks. His recent visits to major oil exporters such as Brazil, Russia, Angola, and Algeria underscore his concerns. A relationship with Brazil would provide a balance to Cuba's current dependency, while others could bring with it corrupt and unsavory business practices. Only when Cuba diversifies suppliers and develops its own resources estimated by the USGS to be at 5.5 billion barrels of oil and 9.8 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, will it have the economic independence needed in order to consider a political and economic evolution. Although Cuban authorities have invited United States oil companies to participate in developing their offshore oil and natural gas resources, US law does not allow it. Today, international oil companies such as Spain's Repsol, Norway's Statoil North Hydro, and Brazil's Petrobras are active in exploration activities in Cuba's Gulf of Mexico waters. American oil and oil and equipment service companies have the capital, technology, and operational know-how to explore, produce, and refine in a safe and responsible manner Cuba's potential oil and natural gas reserves. Yet, they remain on the sidelines because of almost five decade old unilateral political and economic embargo. The president can end this impasse by licensing American companies to participate in developing Cuba's offshore oil and natural gas. In the opinion of legal experts consulted, Mr. Chairman, no legislation prevents the president from authorizing U.S. oil companies from developing Cuba's oil and natural gas reserves. A Cuban government, influenced by its energy benefactors, would most likely result in a continuation of the current political and economic model. If Cuba's future leaders are unable to fill the vacuum, the power vacuum left by the departure of the old cadre, they could become pawn of illicit business activities, drug cartels, and the United States could face a mass illegal immigration by hundreds of thousands of Cubans. The Brookings Report proposes, Mr. Chairman, as part of a phased strategy, a policy that supports the emergence of a Cuban state, 
where the Cuban people determine the political and economic future of their country through democratic means. And to achieve this goal, Mr. Chairman, Cuba must achieve energy independence. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, if U.S. companies were allowed to contribute in developing Cuba's hydrocarbon reserves, as well as renewable energy, such as solar, wind, and sugarcane ethanol, it would reduce the influence of autocratic and corrupt government on the island's road towards self-determination. Most importantly, it would provide the United States and other democratic countries with a better chance of working with Cuba's future leaders to carry out reforms that would lead to a more open and representative society. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Pinion. Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my argument today is that Cuba can play... Dr. Lee, could I ask you to either pull the mic a little closer or, or make sure that it's on? Uh, my argument today is that Cuba can play a potentially pivotal role in controlling the Caribbean drug trade and that this reality creates both opportunities and challenges for U.S.-Cuban relations. Cuba's geographical location makes it a tempting target for international traffickers. The island lies only 90 miles from Key West on a direct flight path from Colombia's Caribbean coast to the southeastern United States. Cuba claims to have seized some 65 tons of drugs in the past decade, most of it heading toward the Bahamas and the United States. The United States and Cuba have an obvious mutual interest in stemming this flow and in preventing Colombian and Mexican cocaine kingpins from setting up shop on the island. Yet they have not entered into a formal agreement to fight drugs, although Cuba maintains such agreements with more than 30 other countries. And what cooperation exists occurs episodically on a case-by-case -case basis. Washington and Havana need to engage more fully on the issue, jointly deploying intelligence and interdiction assets to disrupt smuggling networks that operate in the Western Caribbean. To date, though, Washington has shied away from a deeper relationship, fearing that this would lead to a political opening and confer a measure of legitimacy upon the Castro regime. Yet current strategic realities in the region and Havana's evident willingness to engage in such a relationship, as well as impending leadership changes in Cuba, argue that we should rethink these concerns. The cooperative framework that I envisage does not imply approval of the Castro regime. It would entail increased U.S. law enforcement presence on the island and increased bureaucrat to bureaucrat contacts at the working level that might serve as a platform for reshaping U.S. relations with Cuba during a time of leadership transition. Now, Cuba has some history of high-level official connections to Colombian cocaine exporters, and I describe these at some length in my written testimony. But in the past 20 years, the regime has made a considerable effort to distance itself from these criminal associations, expanding anti-drug cooperation with Western and Latin American nations, and adopting an increasingly prohibitionist approach toward illegal drugs at home that includes some of the most draconian anti-drug legislation anywhere on the planet. This incidentally contrasts very sharply with the ha harm reductionist and non-coercive drug control policies being espoused by some Latin American leaders. Several factors may account for this shift, a growing internal market for cocaine and marijuana, the need for international acceptance following, following the collapse of the USSR, uh, Cuba's main patron at the time, and a perceived juxtaposition of international drug connections and pressures for economic and political reform inside Cuba. For these reasons and others, a U.S.-Cuban entente against the hemispheric drug threat, unthinkable a decade or more ago, seems worthy of consideration today, despite vast differences in our political systems and the absence of diplomatic ties. In any case, we need to look forward and not backward in managing relations with that country. The drug threat from Cuba seems likely to increase with time as the Castro regime's revolutionary order loses its hold and appeal. More opening to foreign trade and investment, coupled with liberalization of the economy and some loosening of political controls, could foster new alliances of convenience between criminally inclined Cuban nationals 
and South American or Mexican drug cartels. Interdiction successes in Mexico and resulting shifts in drug routes eastward to the Caribbean could aggravate these problems, culminating in the emergence of a bastion of organized crime and drugs only 90 miles from U.S. shores, an outcome, I think, hardly in the best interests of the United States and other countries in the hemisphere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Flake. Uh, I want to commend you for having this hearing. I think that our policy towards Cuba has been an extremely ambitious one, but it's also been one that's been very unexamined. Uh, so I think it's a very good thing that Congress looked piece by piece at this policy as you're, as you're doing here, especially when you consider that for all the changes that President Obama has made, and they're good changes, uh, the policy remains 90 percent that of President Bush, and there's a lot to examine. With regard to the security issues that, that you bring us here to discuss today, I agree with, with General McCaffrey that I don't, I don't believe that Cuba represents a security threat to us. I think the security issue for us is whether we want to seize the opportunity to address some security issues that are regional in nature uh, and by, by talking with the Cubans and seeing if it's possible to establish or increase our cooperation. So I think that it would make sense for the United States to talk more intensively with Cuba about migration. We already have migration accords with them, but there may be, uh, there may be additional steps we can take to address issues such as alien smuggling, which is a, a, a transnational crime. And, and as you know, there are rings of alien smugglers that, that, are, that are unscrupulous, that put people's lives at risk, that have killed migrants, and that also operate through Mexico and, and, and complicate our relationship with Mexico and cause the Mexican government a great deal of, of grief. Uh, we, of course, should talk more about, about drug trafficking with Cuba. We have limited cooperation with them. In my, in my statement, which I, don't, I would ask that you put in the record, I cite at length the, uh, the assessment of the U.S. State Department that was just put out last month, which basically says that, the, that, that, that our cooperation with Cuba works reasonably well and that Cuba's in the habit of passing on actionable information when they get it about drug shipments passing through their territory. We should talk about the environment with Cuba for a very simple reason. Take a map, look at where Cuba's thinking of drilling, look at where the Gulf Stream goes, and see that, the, that it ends up on the eastern coast of Florida, and take into account that that area of, off Florida's coast is the area of greatest biodiversity in our marine environment anywhere. An accident in, in Cuba's offshore area where they're going to drill for oil becomes our problem within a matter of days. So it, it, is, it is nuts that the United States is not talking to Cuba about, about the, the normal disaster preparedness things that we would do if it were any other country. I'll add also that I think we should have military to military relations with Cuba, or at least we should explore. Uh, it, is, it, is, uh, uh, it makes no sense whatsoever that our SOUTHCOM commanders know the leadership of the military institutions everywhere in the hemisphere, but not that of Cuba. Certainly, if you, you look at the, the, the relation, the military to military relationship we have with China, it's not, it's not a bowl of cherries. It doesn't work perfectly, but it's gone on for, for about two decades with all the incidents that have, that have occurred and with the broad differences we have because the idea is to establish relationships, to establish uh, a, a, an understanding of each side's intentions and to work on things such as crisis prevention. And certainly without exhausting our imaginations too much, it's, it's easy to think of crises that could, that could occur in the straits between the United States and Cuba. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I was struck by Mr. Issa's opening statement. Even though he's departed the room, I want to address myself a little bit to him. Because I think, that I, I, I believe in, in all these initiatives I just stated to you, but I believe them in the context of, of greater engagement. And as a Republican listening to him, I hear him expressing some of, the, some of the doubts and issues that come to any Republican's mind or to many Americans' mind when you think of Cuba. And that is a very clear revulsion against the human rights practices of the Cuban government, not in a political science theory way, but because those practices hold down the Cuban people, suppress their creativity and their energy and their ability to make a better life for themselves. And at the same time, a question, of, a, a, a nagging question of whether we should engage. 
on a more broad, in a broader sense, as, as Mr. Issa referred, as, as we do with China. We let, we let as he, he said, that we allow Americans to travel there and we allow Chinese students to come here. But he asked the question, well, what would be the right time to engage? Well, I, I would just say this, what time is it in Cuba? It's the end of an era in Cuba right now. Our influence is low. We, we're a superpower and we think we can do a lot of things, but, but so it's a little hard for us to swallow sometimes. This country is so close to us, our influence is very low. Our influence is low because our contacts are very low. They're at a time now when this generation of the Castros that won the revolution, the clock is running out and they're going to be leaving. The younger generation to whom uh, uh, President McCaffrey, General McCaffrey referred is in the wings and they know that, that the system, it's not a failed system, but it's not working. Young people don't have hope. Young people are such a precious resource, they're emigrating and want to emigrate in very large numbers. There's severe income inequality that they haven't been able to solve, and there's not hope among the younger generation. They don't create enough jobs. This younger generation knows they've got to do something to address those issues because they'll be much worse if the current, if the current generation doesn't get to them before they leave. So they've got these huge problems hanging, and what's our response? Well, we don't really want to connect with the next generation. Oh, you want to invite Cuban academics here? Well, no, our policy won't allow that. You want to, you want to have conferences in Cuba? Well, well, you, well the, the Treasury Department's going to stop you because of the, what you would spend on that. We, our universities want to have, a, have, a, have student exchanges? Well, no, you can't get a license for that. If it's a two-week program, it's got to be 10 weeks or more. High school students? No, they can't go to Cuba. All the people-to-people uh, -people programs abolished under the Bush administration. It's no wonder we have no influence in that country because we don't have contact there. So I, I would say th this is a moment, with all respect to his question, of course it's the right question to ask when. I would say that the time is now because this is a time when, when, when of all times, we should be seeking to engage that next generation of Cubans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Peters. And, uh, in response to your comment, uh, all of your statement and all of all the other witnesses statements will be incorporated into the record Thank by you. unanimous consent. Uh, and Mr. Pinon, I noticed that in your written remarks, you asked that a, a report uh, entitled Cuba, a new policy of critical and constructive engagement that was just released last week also be uh, put on the record. And if you still wish that to be done uh, with unanimous consent, uh, that will happen. Ms. Stevens, please. Thank you, Chairman Tierney. Ranking Member Frick, am I on? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Flake and the members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to appear before you today. I serve as the Executive Director of the Center for Democracy in the Americas. It's a nonprofit, non-governmental, independent organization. Our Freedom to Travel campaign has taken bipartisan delegations with over 60 members of the House and Senate and their professional staffs to Cuba since 2001. With the prospects for talks between the U.S. and Cuban governments increasing, having a discussion now about how engagement can best serve our nation's security and broader interests could not be more timely. Earlier this year, our organization published uh, this report, The Nine Ways for Us to Talk to Cuba and for Cuba to Talk to Us. Mr. Chairman, I'd appreciate having this submitted to the record as well. Without objection. Thank you. Our contributors, who include a former combatant commander of SOUTHCOM, a Homeland Security appointee from the Bush administration, energy scholars from the James Baker Institute at Rice University, and authorities on issues from migration to academic exchange, all argued this. Rather than refusing to engage with Cuba diplomatically, our country could best promote our national interest and our values by engaging Cuba's government in talks about problems that concern us both. This report is a direct outgrowth of our organization's trip to the island. Our delegations speak to government officials, the Catholic Church, civil society, foreign embassies and foreign investors, artists, ordinary people, about everything from their private aspirations to their views about U.S. policy. These conversations drive home to the policymakers the cost of our isolation from the Cuban people in powerful and practical ways beyond simple commerce. Isolation stops us from working with Cuba on issues we've heard about today, like migration and counter-narcotics that lie at the core of our neighborhood's security. 
It prevents our diplomats at the U.S. interest section from doing what their counterparts at foreign embassies do, traveling the island or meeting with Cuban officials. Many Cubans find our refusal to sit down with their government and acknowledge its sovereignty disrespectful to them and their country. And this isolation from Cuba redu reduces the United States to bystander status, as Phil said, and Cubans seek, as Cubans are seeking to determine their future. After these trips, almost every member of our delegations asks, why aren't we talking to these people? We don't propose talk for its own sake. Instead, experts like those here today and the qualified scholars we recruited for our book have identified proposals that would allow Washington and Havana to work together on issues of concern to both countries. Let me highlight just a few of those recommendations. On security issues, they urge increased dialogue between the Cuban Armed Forces and the U.S. Southern Command, greater intelligence sharing to fight drug trafficking, and increasing contacts between the DEA, the Marshal Service, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and their Cuban counterparts. To help with, with hurricane preparedness and self-defense, they suggest allowing Cuban scientists and emergency managers to visit the United States and share information on evacuation plans, post-disaster medical support, and citizen disaster preparedness education programs. And permitting U.S. scientists and emergency managers to visit Cuba and observe storm evacuations in real time. Our medical research and academic exchange, they advocate removing Cuba from the state sponsors of terrorism list to allow exchanges of professionals in healthcare and research, lifting restrictions on educational trips to facilitate medical education, and including Cuba in the Fulbright program and the Benjamin A. Gilman International Scholarship Program. In every case, these recommendations and others in the report can offer tangible benefits for both Cubans and Americans and improve the prospect that our governments will address issues that have divided us for so long. Engagement is not a panacea. We know that the differences between the United States and Cuba cannot be papered over, and that the U.S. has profound disagreements with Cuba on, about how best to advance the ideas of human rights and democracy. But the message today is this. If we wait for Cuba to capitulate as a precondition for our talking to them, or if Cuba waits for us to repeal the embargo before they'll talk to us, nothing will ever change, and the status quo is increasingly harmful to U.S. national and diplomatic interests. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we need to accept these facts and take the initiative, not in leaps and bounds, <clears throat> but with small steps on concrete issues where cooperation is in our national interest and likely to yield real results. The administration appears ready to follow this approach, and it's our hope that the ideas like those in our Nine Ways report will be helpful to them and to this committee going forward. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, like all of the other witnesses, your testimony is, uh, is extremely helpful, and we're appreciative of it. We're going to go into our uh, question and answer period here, and uh, I'd just like to begin by noting that General McCaffrey, in your written remarks, you indicate, obviously, the Cubans will have to define their own political systems and determine the pace of transition. You note that outsiders can be supportive, and those outsiders include the United States, Latin American nations, European Union, non-governmental organizations, and multilateral organizations. But in the end, Cubans have to own and be in charge of the process of determining their own future political system and rules of engagement. Given that, who should take the lead on that? Should it be a regional uh, organization, a nonprofit organization, a uh, international organization or a particular country? Well, it's probably at the heart and soul of how we move ahead. It, it seems to me, back to Congressman Flake's uh, uh, opening remarks, that uh, the opening salvo of engagement on Cuba ought to be U.S. unilateral decisions. And there's a series of them. The easiest ones, of course, being the economic embargo, people, uh, law enforcement cooperation, that sort of thing. Then there's some dramatic moves we could make. Uh, some of which really don't cost us anything. Uh, uh, Mr. Castro engaged me for a couple of hours on he wants his spies back uh, from Florida. Uh, and I told him, I remember telling him, I said, Mr. Uh, Castro, I'm, I'm sure you're very proud of these men and they're uh, Cuban patriots and you'll get them back eventually when we have normalized relations. So at some point, they may be another pawn we can throw to Castro to allow him to move ahead. It seems to me, however, that the real process of bringing Cuba back into the family of the Americas ought to be multinational. We ought to go find uh, um, multiple mechanisms that allow us to be one of many engaging with Cuba. Uh, 
and certainly that includes the Organization of American States, uh, which indeed needs something to develop its own muscle power, and Cuba might uh, certainly be one of them. But then there's obviously international organizations. Uh, the United Nations itself has several law enforcement mechanisms that could serve our uh, purpose on counter-drug cooperation. I don't think U.S.-Cuba direct dialogue in the immediate future is li likely to be as effective as going to multinational engagement. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Peters, there were great comments of all of the positive things that could come from uh, re-engaging with Cuba. Uh, if that re-engagement were actually to take place, are there potential negatives for which we ought to be prepared uh, to deal with? Uh, should things get normalized eventually? Will there be consequences of that uh, which will impact the United States in such a way that they're going to have to get prepared in advance? Immigration being one that comes to my mind right away, but uh, that or others? Well, I don't, Mr. Chairman, see a particular downside in engaging with Cuba on, uh, on migration, on drugs, uh, on environmental protection. I mean, I think, I think those are very, or, or for that matter, establishing mil military to military relations. I think that uh, we should, I don't think that the, the thing is to deal with Cuba as if it was any other country. I think we should deal with Cuba as we have dealt with communist countries in, 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 across, across administrations of both Democrats and Republicans with our eyes wide open. And, uh, uh, but but on, these, on these security issues, I don't see a, a particular downside. I also, I think it's important to, to point out, I don't believe that um, Cuba is necessarily going to be an ideal partner on all these things. Uh, we, we have good cooperation on, on, uh, on drug interdiction, but that took some time to get going. And there were some bumps along the way, if, if you talk to people in the Coast Guard that were, that were involved in that. Uh, perhaps there was a sense in your question about long-term migration, uh, long-term Im immigration <coughs> policy. I, I believe that immigration policy is something that should be examined. It's, it's interesting that in, in Miami right now, there, there, there's some discussion about the need to perhaps re-examine our, our immigration policy. It's unique towards Cuba. Cubans come here without a visa and set foot on our, on our territory and they're admitted. Um, within a year, they're, they're permitted to, to, to move towards legal permanent residence. And from the very beginning, they get a lot of government benefits, the same package of government benefits that a refugee would get. These are people who come without a visa and don't claim or meet the standard of, of, of having a well-founded fear of persecution if they were to return. There's some debate in Miami now about whether that should, whether that should continue or not, especially when Cuban Americans are now free to travel back and forth. And certainly that, that, this policy that we have, which is purely at executive discretion, is not something that was contemplated in the Cuban Adjustment Act, although it's permitted by it. So I think that's something worth looking at. Thank you. And finally, Ms. Stevens, uh, you note that the uh, interest section that the United States has in Cuba is not doing some of the very ordinary things that their counterparts in other foreign embassies do. What are they doing? What are, what are the people in our U.S. What are the people in, If they're not doing the traveling the island, meeting with officials, and the normal things that you would expect for embassies to do, can you give us some observations of what uh, effect they are having and what they are doing? Well, uh, it, it sort of depends who, who, who's there. Um, the, the current chief of the um, U.S. intersection is, um, is Mr. Farrar, and um, he, I think, is, is doing a very good job of um, Having his having eyes and ears out as far as he can go, he's really making a genuine effort to understand what's going on within the boundaries of, of where he's allowed to travel on the island. I, when I was last in Cuba, um, I had a meeting with him at the intersection, and then the next morning ran into him at the church across the harbor um, in Regla. He's clearly trying to learn and understand within the limitations he has. Um, you know. Others have done it differently. Previous um, chiefs have, have put up billboards along the um, highway in front of the interest section that are, um, I'm sorry, I haven't put up billboards, but have put up uh, electronic signs, you probably heard about this, that, that run, um, run news and then accusations about um, the reality on, Cuba, on the island um, that are meant, I guess, to, were meant to educate. 
the Cuban population, but instead embarrassed the United States and infuriated um, the Cubans. So I would say, you know, it kind of depends who, who's there. Um, but they definitely have a very limited experience not being able to talk to the Cuban government. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Flake. Thank you. I, I appreciate all of the testimony. It was a very, very enlightening. Uh, General McCaffrey, you, you, you mentioned that uh, I liked your statement that uh, we've truncated and minimized our access to that regime and the people in that regime. And uh, certainly that's been my experience there. We have no idea who the people in waiting are there, and that, that's a bit troubling. But uh, one thing that we always hear is we, we can't engage uh, with a country or we can't allow Americans to travel to a country uh, that is uh, one of our listed state sponsors of terrorism. Does that give you any pause uh, in making the recommendations that you've made to, to lift the embargo or whatnot? Should we be doing that to somebody, some country that has been identified as a state sponsor of terrorism? Yeah, there, um, I think there are still, what, seven nations on state sponsors of terrorism, and it's uh, something that uh, the Cuba, Cuba piece of it, I think, is 80 words or very cryptic because there's probably no current reality to that at all. Uh, I think in past years you could have made that argument 25 years ago. They were an active threat. They had 250,000 troops uh, in Africa. They were uh, uh, very aggressively with covert agents uh, trying to foment uh, revolutions around the Americas, but I don't think that's the case any longer. I cannot imagine the Cubans realistically being a threat to our uh, national security interests in the short run. Now, having said that, again, I think uh, Mr. Peters m makes a good point. You know, we ought, to, we ought to have a dialogue with them with our eyes wide open. Uh, but, but clearly, um, five years from today, if we don't know who the one-star generals and the battalion commanders and the key intelligence officers are in Cuba, uh, we have harmed our own ability to, to uh, protect the interests of the American people. We've got to get down there and engage with them. Uh, we ought to have uh, influence. Uh, we ought to give them something to prize as opposed to uh, merely withholding uh, things from, from their society. And it, it seems to me, again, the downside risk is almost non-existent. Mr. Pignon, it's often said as well that we uh, somehow lend legitimacy uh, to the regime uh, if we uh, take action to engage them on, on issues of national security or drug interdiction or migration. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, do we somehow lend legitimacy to that regime? Um, you know, I, I come from the private sector, and early on I learned uh, uh, from a former boss of mine that when you read it in the front page of the Wall Street Journal, it's too late. Uh, and so I believe in early engagement. Uh, early engagement somehow gets misdirected. I mean, we're talking about conversations. We're talking about dialogue at different levels. Uh, I was just in Cuba three weeks ago. Uh, I was there at the time of the baseball game between Cuba and Japan. Uh, and uh, let me tell you, people in the street want to engage you. They do want to talk. They want to talk about the U.S. They want to talk about President Obama. Uh, so I think the fear of engagement, the fear of conversation, particularly in the case of Cuba, uh, there is really no justification for not having it. Right. Mr. Peters, do you have a comment on that on, on, as far as the legitimacy argument? Is it a moot point after 50 years that the regime is in place that we would somehow lend legitimacy to it? or, or, a, or uh, I don't Because know that, that, that is point. often brought up, I can tell you, among mm -hmm. uh, in, in Congress here, it's, it's should we lend legitimacy uh, to that regime at this point? That, well, that seems to me to be a, 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 a diplomatic issue that would be raised in the, in the very early months of a government such as Cuba's when there is doubt as to whether it's going to hang on or not. But we're quite a bit past that point. And I, don't, and I don't think that, th that that issue or any of the variations of it that, that, that imply that Cuba is on the brink uh, and, that, and that whether we engage or not is gonna, uh, is gonna change the equation in a decisive way, I don't think any of those, those arguments hold water. But more importantly, I, I don't think that it, I think, it's, I think the fact that this issue comes up tells us just how far out of the mainstream of American foreign policy this policy is. President Reagan engaged with, with the Soviet Union 
uh, President Nixon engaged with China. Presidents of both parties have engaged with all kinds of governments that are, that are not particularly nice and that where we have very, very vast differences in terms of our, our security interests and our, and, our, and our values and about things like human rights practices. And I don't think that, it, um, that President Reagan's trips to the Soviet Union, his, his, his walking around Moscow with, with Gorbachev, anything like that, and I think no one would, would say that President Reagan was legitimizing the Soviets or their system. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Driehaus, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sorry I missed the oral testimony. I was in a markup in another committee, but I appreciate the opportunity to ask a few questions today. Um, I, I noticed in, in your written testimony, General McCaffrey, that you noted um, that Cubans must own and be in charge of the process of determining uh, their future political system. And the U.S. can be supportive uh, of that effort, effort. How have you seen the attitudes of Cubans on the ground change um, in recent times to suggest that uh, this is a, a unique opportunity to, to engage and, and to pursue uh, more open relations. And it, have you seen that? Is there an attitude in Cuba that, that this is a unique time and that we do have a, a critical uh, opportunity to engage? Well, you know, I, I, I would probably say it's more a unique time in the United States than in Cuba that for the first year of this new administration, there's a, a tremendous openness to new thinking, to racing past mistakes. Uh, we've been, it, uh, I say this painfully, discredited in many ways in the international community. So I think uh, we have an opportunity to proceed unilaterally to uh, change the nature of the debate. In Cuba, by the way, years ago, I lose track of time, 96 or so, uh, I had 10, 15,000 Cubans uh, pulled out of the sea and end up under my care in Panama. We had, uh, uh, had them there in really as refugee status. I spent a lot of time walking around talking to Cubans from all walks of life, from intel officers that had been stuck into that flow, uh, to military officers, to business people, to families, whatever. And it came across to me that though, you know, there's a general notion that Fidel was uh, a national symbol that they admired. Uh, but almost uniformly across every aspect of Cuban society as I talked to them, uh, they thought that these people were, uh, had a failed uh, philosophical approach. Uh, the economics wasn't going to work. It would never change as long as they were in power. And that's why they took grandmother and children and everyone and went down to the sea to escape. They were seeking freedom from a failed system. I don't think there's any support long term among the ranking. Uh, the citizens of Cuba for this kind of regime. But I, but I do think the power still flows out of the barrel of a gun, and until we have engaged in new ideas and opportunities and thinking and tourism and uh, engagement uh, people to people happens, that it's unlikely that Cuba is going to represent anything but an insular um, prison. And, and just as a follow-up to uh, Congressman Flake's uh, uh, question, regarding whether or not we are legitimizing uh, the Cuban governance structure and, and some of their human rights uh, efforts or violations uh, by engaging them. Can you draw a comparison, and, and I appreciate, Mr. Peters, the, the comparison with the Soviet Union and the visits to the Soviet Union, but, you know, obviously we are very engaged with China. And are there substantive differences in terms of uh, regime, in terms of human rights policies, uh, between Cuba and China such that Cuba is so much worse that we wouldn't engage them uh, versus uh, the, the types of practices we currently engage with in China. Was that addressed to me, sir? At you or Mr. Peter? Well, or the, you know, I, I was sort of thinking with some amusement. I've been a uh, negotiator in international arms control and other drug policy, and I've dealt with a lot of people around the face of the earth, uh, many of whom I was thinking uh, throughout the dialogue that probably the next uh, U.S. Uh, visit would be from the United States Air Force. Um, some truly dreadful regimes that we opened dialogue because we thought it served our interests and our own people. And certainly the pre-Balkan uh, uh, Serbian leadership that was enslaving a lot of the region and uh, for that matter dealing with the Russians, trying to uh, help them get away from their dreadful past with tens of millions murdered by their own political system. Uh, 
So I cannot imagine that uh, the United States, notwithstanding the, uh, the damage that's been done by our reputation the last few years by some missteps, uh, but I cannot imagine that our uh, international reputation for our values, for open government, for opportunity, for the way in which minorities and women have taken their place in our society, it's hard to imagine uh, that we uh, would, uh, would uh, damage that uh, reputation by dealing with the Cubans. It's silly, completely silly. We're dealing with the North Koreans, for God's sakes. Uh, they've murdered a million of their own people through starvation and gulags. They've got nuclear weapons. They're a tremendous threat to the region. Uh, we're, we're dealing correctly uh, with the Iranians now in a very careful way. Uh, so again, I, I think most of the other panel apparently feels the same way. The lack of, of, of open dialogue, public dialogue with the Cubans is a huge mistake and needs to be corrected. And the window might close on us uh, within a year or so. Thank you. Mr. Fortenberry, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to return to the question that uh, Congress Member Flake posed about um, conferring legitimacy by the potential engagement and look at that through another nuanced perspective. Not so much legitimacy on the current regime, but the legitimacy in the sense of potentially extending the power and authority of the current regime into time if we empower them with resources by the types of, uh, uh, well, perhaps more aggressive engagement, particularly economically, that, that you sometimes see some persons uh, very interested in. I think that's an important point because as a few, several years ago before coming to Congress, as I was just simply looking at this from perspective of a citizen watching American public policy dynamics in the region, uh, it had occurred to me that uh, some movement in a, in a direction of potential engagement with the country seemed reasonable. There seemed to be some opening for um, uh, liberalization in society with differing viewpoints that occurred. A number of people took that opportunity and 75 academics, political scientists, journalists, librarians were then thrown into jail, many of them still into jail. Uh, several were executed who had tried to leave. Uh, that was a grave reminder of what we're dealing with here. So two questions. Conferring legitimacy in this, in, to the extent that it has the risk of extending the brutality of the regime into the future and secondly, engagement with whom? They could engage with us tomorrow. They, they, they could throw the door wide open and I'm sure we would uh, rush through it and embrace them if, if there was a change of perspective and a certain um, uh, increase of their capacity for that society to respect human rights and reevaluate itself based, on, based upon some fundamental principles that inform the hearts of all humanity. So. I throw that question to all of you since we've all talked, you all have touched on the, that narrative thread. I, you know, I, I think your, your concerns are entirely on, on target. Uh, my take on it was that, the, first of all, if I thought strangling Cuba economically would bring down the regime, uh, it might be an appropriate course of action to consider. But it hasn't worked. In fact, I think the last time, the last time we tightened the screws in the last couple of years, um, uh, a lot of the Cuban-American community said, yeah, let's give it a chance. Maybe it'll work. It hasn't. And so you've seen these dramatic changes in polling data now out of the Cuban-American community, where particularly the younger people are saying, this isn't the way to go. Our families are suffering. Uh, we want open access to them. Uh, so I think the mood of the country, by the way, has changed dramatically, our country, uh, and they're open now to new thinking. Uh, an another thought just to offer it, I've participated in an awful lot of U.S. efforts to bring somebody to their knees through blockades and economic embargoes, Serbia, the Iraqis, the North Koreans, and others, and it never works. <laughs> Um, you know, normally what happens is you end up lowering the lifestyle of the broad population. Serbia certainly springs to mind. And suddenly cigarette smugglers become the wealthiest people in Serbia. Uh, 
So you distort the economy, you distort the, you magnify the control of the repressive forces. Um, I, now, there may be some room for some of that. Certainly, if we're worried about nuclear weapons, we have to be very careful about technology access for some of these regimes. But again, it's hard for me to think in my own mind objectively of a reason why we don't unilaterally uh, open the floodgates of ideas, people, and access to Cuba. And then, uh, in the coming decade, because I think we're talking about 10 years to reintegrate Cuba, uh, try and work in a very positive way and not determine their future, but assist them in thinking through and struggling through this issue. Your pushback was one that we received at Brookings when we put on the table the proposal of somehow finding a, a way that we could delink Cuba from Venezuela. Because our proposal was to open the energy sector. And the answer of the pushback was, well, that could certainly have an effect in which it will continue supporting the current regime. Uh, so we went through that scenario planning. We did spend at least a day and a half on that. And we found that it was very, very important to find a way to delink Cuba from Venezuela. The first 30 years of the Cuban revolutions partly was successful because of its dependency on the Soviet Union. And for the last eight years, Cuba today economically is still going because of its dependency on Venezuela. Oil, oil development is going to take congressmen at least anywhere between three to five years. So it's something that is not going to happen overnight. It will take at least three to five years. And Cuba will have to produce at least 200,000 barrels a day in order for them to net the same economic benefit that they're receiving today from Venezuela. So the issue of opening Cuba's energy sector for exploration and production for U.S. companies was a way of delinking Cuba from Venezuela because we don't believe that Cuba can make its own decisions in the future depending on Venezuela. Well, these are hard Thank you. If questions. the other members uh, of the panel want to give a brief response to Mr. Fortenberry's question, uh, we'd appreciate that. But I know they're going to call votes on us again in a second. I don't want to have to ask all of you to wait and come back. So uh, Dr. Lee, Mr. Peters, Mr. Stevens, we want to run through that. Uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, um, I mean, I've opinions on uh, this question that uh, uh, Congressman Flake uh, uh, rose uh, really run the gamut. I mean, I've heard people, for example, uh, uh, people uh, within some of the communities here, uh, United States and Washington, Miami, uh, arguing that we should simply close down the U.S. interest section uh, in Havana and simply cut off all contact with Cubans. Um, this is my, my view of how to deal with how to manage the U.S.-Cuban relationship is very different. Um, as you know, I favor increasing, intensifying, deepening uh, law enforcement and even intelligence cooperation with the Cubans with respect to the issue of the hemispheric drug, drug threat. Um, and I think that the more contact that we have uh, uh, with the intelligence people, the law enforcement people, the Cuban military, others that are, that are interested in this, uh, have an interest in, in containing the, the drug problem, the more we're kind of, in a sense, getting into the guts of the, of the Cuban power structure, of the Cuban system. And I think this is where we need to be in order to be able to, um, well, I don't want to use the word manipulate, but shall we say be in a position to creatively observe uh, the transition uh, that, uh, that is going to be occurring very soon as the Castro brothers uh, leave the scene. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To, thank you, Mr. Chairman. To respond to Mr. Fortenberry's question, uh, I don't believe that the, uh, I think it's exactly the right question to, to raise, whether, whether U.S. engagement would extend the life of the, of, the, of the government in Cuba. But I don't think it's in play. Uh, we tend to, we, we look at a place like Cuba, we look at the economy there, and we say to ourselves, God, if, the, if it was like that in the United States, our government would be out. And it's easier to, easy to mirror image that way, but that's, it just hasn't been the case. The Cuban economy is not in great shape. The personal economies of many families are, are not in great shape in Cuba. But these economic difficulties do not translate into political risk for the Cuban government. Uh, 
And in 90, 1992 and 93, when they were at a, uh, in, in the most horrendous economic crisis you can imagine, when the Soviet Union disappeared and left them in a ditch, nutrition levels and everything just, just, just collapsed, then there was not, there was, that, that economic uh, deprivation did not translate into a threat to the political longevity of the Cuban government. So at the margin, our, I don't believe our economic sanctions have any discernible impact on the political longevity of the, longevity of the Cuban government. At the margin, what they do is they stop universities from engaging, they stop people from engaging, they stop somebody from Miami from getting something, some, some help to his, to his aunt so that she can repair her house after a hurricane. They, they stop uh, people from sending money that would help somebody establish a business, whether legitimate or, or, or illegal. Uh, they, they stop cultural activities from taking place at the margin. Our sanctions stop churches and synagogues from engaging. They stop people from being able to send help through religious organizations. So at the margin, it's an embargo on American influence. Finally, I would just invite you to, to think for a minute, though, what would it mean for this policy to work? Because I think we are pretty confident that the Cuban government it's a communist government, and their convictions are quite deep. We've seen that for 50 years. So our sanctions are not going to lead them to change their stripes. Uh, so what would it mean for it to work? Would it mean that we would create such terrible economic conditions that the Cuban people would have such acute suffering that they would see no, nothing to do but to revolt against their government? That, that, that to me, is, is not likely. Because when, Cuba, when the economy gets bad, they think about leaving. They don't think about revolting, and that's not a criticism. That's just a political fact of life. But it gets into, a, uh, I think, a, a fairly serious ethical question of what, it, what would it mean if it would actually work. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Ms. Stevens, do you have something to quickly offer? Yes, very quickly. I just wanted to thank you for, for bringing up the, the um, issue of human rights and the question of the 75 um, dissidents who were rounded up um, in what was it, 2003? Um, I, was, I was fortunate to be in Cuba with um, Congressman Flake, Mr. Peters, Mr. Delahunt, and a, a delegation um, just a couple weeks before that roundup. And we met publicly with many of those dissidents um, and had a very valuable and moving um, encounter with them. And, and for me, for me, the, I, that's probably the, the strongest and, and most important experience I have had in Cuba. And it very much motivates me to want to try something new in terms of U.S. policy in order to prevent things like that from happening. For me, that's an example of how our current policy isn't having any impact at all in helping these people. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Mr. Delahunt, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I see that Mr. Easter is here. I know he's a member of the committee. I obviously would defer to him if he wishes to proceed. Mr. Issa is a member of the full committee, but I'll be. I'll be here. And on leave of absence from uh, foreign affairs, and miss it deeply. Well, we note we note your absence, Mr. <laughs> Easter, and some of us miss you too. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, as they say, the heart grows fonder the longer I'm away from the committee. <laughs> the, uh, and this is an important committee hearing because I, I believe it does sort of cross uh, foreign policy and foreign security. Let me go through a couple of quick questions. Uh, 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 Ms. Stevens, is there any basis based on, not based on a change in policy, but based on your past experience, including going there, meeting with dissidents, uh, sort of sort of playing up the good of what could be, and then seeing them arrested and or killed and, and put away for a long time without trials, is there any reason to believe that the Castro regime would change if there were no quid pro quo at the time of opening relations, but rather we opened relations unilaterally, effectively said, well, we've been wrong for 50 years, and you don't have to do anything in return for a lift of the travel ban, et cetera? Well, I think you've gotten right to the question. <laughs> that is the question on the you table. You have to push that button, Ms. Stevens, please. I think it was on. I think there you go. Just not, not, you know. just um, have to have a booming voice that okay. God didn't necessarily <laughs> give you at birth. 
Um, first of all, the Cubans will never sit down to talk with us if the precondition of sitting down has anything to do with us telling them that they should change their system, that they should release their prisoners, anything of a domestic political nature. They're just not going to do it. So that's a, that's a non-starter. Okay, let me follow up with that because that, that's probably the crux to my question. The, they're members of the UN. Uh, they're a, a, a signatory nation to almost, almost every agreement that's come down the pike since uh, Jesus was a corporal, they have signed on to. I think they're probably in Kyoto. Uh, and since they only seem to burn organic leftovers most of the time or import their oil, I guess they're compliant. Uh, they have signed everything. They have obeyed nothing. Isn't it reasonable for the United States as part of our engagement and any liberalization that would benefit them, if you will, at our expense, isn't it reasonable to ask them to obey, not to change their own laws, but to obey international law, particularly in the many, many places with their signatories. Yes. Okay. But, so, but, so there are some things that we could put in as effective preconditions, as long as it's not our conditions or their domestic policy, but rather international law, which they claim to abide by. I just think if we could take a deep breath and decide that it's in our interest to just sit down with them, just skip the precondition notion. Just sit down at the table. Congressman Flake sat down with them. They, they, they've had that. It could be no higher calling than, uh, that, you know, this, he, he did his mission elsewhere, but he came back to do, do Fidel. The, uh, Could I the, just, just say one thing about the way, because we also um, spent a lot of time visiting with um, uh, diplomats from other countries who, who do have relations with the Cuban government. And for me, that's where, that's where the model exists. Now, I'm not saying, obviously, that they've changed, you know, through their, you know, great conversations with the Cuban government, that they've changed um, okay. the, the country from being communist. But they have had some successes in quiet discussions about specific human rights cases and specific political prisoners. So well, and, I and think I appreciate, that that's a way to start. I appreciate that. And I've, I've been involved in that. I'm fortunate enough to be on the Helsinki Commission. And, and we do try to look at that globally. Mr. Pinon, uh, Pinon I hopefully get it close enough with my lack of any foreign language uh, skills at all. Uh, Assuming we were to allow U.S. oil companies to drill in the region or engage in any other way, what good faith to belief do we have that they would not, at the appropriate time in their best interest, nationalize our resources as Hugo Chavez has done or as they did before and still owe countless billions to us over it? Is there, any, is there anything under the current regime that would cause us to think that that could not likely occur again and it wouldn't be completely consistent with uh, their communist uh, form of government. No, and, and that's why, like I said earlier, when we went through our scenario planning, uh, we made a point, and I make a point again in my testimony, that this process takes anywhere between two to five years before any oil can come in production. So the assumption when we went through our recommendation at Brookings was that within that five-year period, there will be, be a movement in Cuba already in which the transition or a new cadre of leadership will be in place. And again, hopefully that will help them to divorce themselves from the dependency on Venezuela. So again, what we're talking about is nothing that it will bring an immediate benefit, economic benefit to the Cuban government. We're talking about three to five years. Okay. The risk of nationalization, yes, it is okay. there. In our Mr. industry, Chairman, we always face I, it. I appreciate just very quickly, if they can't answer directly, maybe for the record, an exit question, which is, in light of those questions and current government, then is your common recommendation that even if the U.S. government does not see clear to lift sanctions and so on, that an engagement with a plan for the change that is likely to appear or to occur is in our best interest based on, if you will, the five-year horizon that you referred to? Yes. Just a straight, yeah. Is that pretty consistent across the board that that's a common recommendation that we should take away from today? No, I, 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 I would. Uh, if we can just you, please keep it brief, and uh, so that I'll we don't very, have those goals fall down. You, you say they might nationalize our resources. I, I'm, I'm not interested in seeing the United States government be involved at all in it. Right. And, I, and I think that that American companies, if they choose to get involved, would have to weigh the risks and risk the loss of their resources. Uh, 
in a country where, where, uh, where the economic policies present that risk. There's no doubt about it. In fact, I, I think what I would add to that is I, I don't see us in this coming phase negotiating changes in Cuba so much as unilaterally lifting the economic embargo, people access, uh, initiating law enforcement cooperation, uh, and, and not blocking them from being buffered by being part of international organizations. I think the negotiations, whether we do it or not, is almost irrelevant until Fidel and Raul are gone, until we get the 40-somethings in government, we shouldn't expect dramatic change in Cuba. But certainly the wash of U.S. ideas, influence, and tourists, in my view, will set, help set the preconditions for those ultimate negotiations. I appreciate that. And Mr. Chairman, for the record, it was Admiral Aldo Santa Maria that I was referring to in my opening remarks. So we just want to thank you for living up to your opening remark that you would be brief. And uh, we appreciate that. We'll know what to expect in the future. Mr. Delahunt. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Excellent uh, hearing. I, I congratulate you and, uh, and the committee on this hearing. I'm just going to make some observations and then invite response if there's sufficient time. I'll, I'll make an effort to be brief. Um, I, I noted that uh, I think it was General McCaffrey that talked about the need for military to military uh, contacts. Every single commander of Southcom that I have discussed this with, and they've made public statements, have echoed that particular sentiment. General Wilhelm, uh, General Pace, uh, and, um, and, and I'm forgetting, uh, and Jack Sheehan, General Jack Sheehan, all recommended the uh, instituting military to military contact. I think it's important to get that on the record. Um, and I would also note for the record that the dissidents that uh, we met with and that were alluded to by Ms. Stevens, uh, every single one of them today, some having been released because of humanitarian uh, concerns, uh, many of them still incarcerated in the uh, Cuban uh, prison system, advocate for change of the current policy and specifically advocate for change uh, in terms of Americans' rights uh, to visit unrestricted and uninhibited to Cuba. I think that's very important and that we should listen to those particular individuals. When it comes to human rights, naturally we share the concerns and I think the uh, question by Mr. Driehaus um, went to that issue. But I would also note that we have relationships uh, with other nations. Uh, in fact, some are our allies where I would submit that their human rights record uh, is worse, in fact, than that of uh, the Cuban government in terms of how we define human rights. Uh, I've been to Cuba. I've been to church there. I've gone to mass there. There is a vibrant, healthy Jewish community there. Uh, clearly, the Catholic Church in, uh, in Cuba has a strained relationship with the government. But one can wear a, a cross, one can wear a, a Star of David in Cuba. You cannot do that in Saudi Arabia. There is, in fact, a religious police in Saudi Arabia. And when President Bush, and I'm referring to President uh, Herbert, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, had to go to an aircraft carrier to uh, celebrate uh, a, 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 a Christian um, uh, a Christian service in terms of uh, uh, celebrating Christmas. So, and, and by the way, I can assure you that women can drive uh, in Cuba. Uh, they cannot drive in Saudi Arabia. And there are no uh, independent unions. And the list goes on and on and on. So I think it's very important to understand that. Uh, if we're going to measure uh, engagement with other nations predicated on the human rights record, uh, we would find ourselves uh, having to terminate uh, diplomatic relationships with a long list that we currently deal with. I think in particular uh, of uh, Uzbekistan, where our own human rights record indicates that uh, uh, Islam Karimov has instructed uh, human beings to be boiled alive. So I, I think we've got to you know, understand that. Um, I'd like to get to, and the state sponsor a terrorism issue, and how do they get there? 
I posed that question uh, a while back, and it was interesting to discover uh, that the primary motivation uh, for the placement of uh, Cuba on, the, uh, on that particular list was because uh, in Cuba there are uh, members of ETA, uh, the Basque separatist uh, organization. Uh, I then went on to learn, however, that that was done at the request of the Spanish government. So maybe that whole issue should be revisited. But I'd like to speak specifically to the issue of drugs. Mr. Peters and I first met at a conference in Havana on drug interdiction. And the reality is, if there's an area that they and we share a mutual interest, it is in dealing uh, with the issue of drugs. Uh, I would uh, you know, invite a response from Mr. Lee or um, um, General McCaffrey, you were the drug czar. I can remember there was a case in, in Florida where cooperation, it was a case involving the seizure of a ship where Cuban agents came and testified and there was a conviction. The ship was the Limerick, if you remember General McCaffrey. So, and by the way, I've never heard of this particular admiral before, and I, I think it was Mr. Lee that indicated that the narcotics laws are draconian, and any good police state is going to be very, very careful in terms of uh, allowing drugs to be uh, sold or purchased or even a transit uh, venue for uh, interdiction here. I cannot imagine why we have not formalized uh, a, a, drug, uh, a drug agreement with Cuba at this point in time. We are doing a disservice to ourselves. We're doing a disservice to our own people. And I would invite, I guess, particular uh, General McCaffrey to respond to the, the drug issue because I have heard again and again from some individuals that, you know, Cuba is a narco-terrorist uh, state. That's pure baloney. General McCaffrey. Mr. Well, I think you probably, uh, you probably summarized my own arguments uh, pretty well. I, it was interesting to me to watch the animosity develop between me and selected members of Congress over the, just that issue. And again, I tried to go to every source of intelligence I could find. Uh, there's no question in my mind that there is corruption at times in the Cuban government and incompetence. Uh, there's no question that, uh, that there are lots of drugs floating around uh, Cuba, particularly washing up on shore, you know, bundles of cocaine and uh, marijuana. Uh, but it was clear to me that they were not on a governmental basis in uh, part of an international conspiracy. It would threaten the regime. It threatened their sense of communist morality. Uh, I did get a Coast Guard element into Cuba over tremendous hue and cry, I think three of them. And uh, one of the panel members mentioned, I, I went on a nighttime walk with that Coast Guard officer. Uh, who knew more about what the Cuban people were thinking and talking about than a dozen of the, of the folks in the Cuban interest se section in Havana. Because he was out, we'd walk his dog and they'd approach him and they'd ask him about the latest thing over Radio Marti. And, uh, so I, uh, again, I think your point is right on track. Uh, our interests are served by law enforcement cooperation, not just interdiction, on human trafficking in human beings, in drugs, in terrorism, and I expect the uh, Cubans would find that uh, to be an, uh, an open option. Now, I think the other thing on Southcom to Cuban military uh, dialogue, uh, not too much of it, not too much training. How do you run great tank mechanized uh, attacks against in high intensity combat? But clearly, uh, dialogue on peacekeeping operations and on international. Uh, humanitarian operations and and others uh, certainly at their officer core level uh, it'd be a great investment in their future I'd bring some of them into our schooling system uh, get two of them to go to Leavenworth you know the first first five years they'd all be Intel people but eventually they'd uh, get jealous and uh, some of the comers would uh, get the slot so Dialogue, engagement uh, on areas of mutual interest, that will work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delahunt, for your contributions to this uh, record. We appreciate it. Uh, as well as your skill of asking a five-minute question and then uh, eliciting an answer afterwards. We will all take note of that. Uh, we have no further questions from the panel here. I want to give each of you an opportunity, however, to make a uh, 
uh, last remark if there's anything that you feel has been left unsaid. I mean, you don't need to make a remark, but I don't want anybody to leave after having invited you here and made you wait. Uh, we want to make sure that you've uh, commented on everything that you thought was relevant for this committee to hear. So, Ms. Stevens, do you have anything to add? Oh, it's okay. almost irresistible, isn't it? Yeah, you've got to say something. <laughs> I, um, you know, I think that one thing that is, is so clear to me um, when we're in Cuba is that, um, that the notion that our embargo is somehow crippling the Cuban economy um, is just, just isn't right. Um, that what we instead have done is we've created a void that has been filled by everybody else. It's been filled by Venezuela, Brazil, Russia, China, Europe. Um, so, so in that sense, it's just not working. And in fact, we're ceding that space to, to others and, 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 and losing the opportunity to have um, influence on the island. So I guess I Thank just you. wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. Mr. Peters, last thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I um, have listened to some of the comments about concessions and, and, and reciprocity. I would address them as follows. I, I think clearly we, we are in a 50-year adversarial relationship with Cuba. It, it could be we'll, we'll get to a point in the relationship where there's a, a negotiation and one side won't give unless there's a concession from the other. Uh, given the fact that the embargo is, is in place and I don't, I don't see it that changing for some time. I think that if people are concerned about leverage, that, that, that that's there. But I, I see the thing, the situation somewhat differently. I mean, that what, what, what is at issue now, I think, is, uh, is, is not a concession to the Cuban government, but concessions to ourselves. I mean, I, we are sort of like a, a chess player that's been playing for a long time, getting nowhere, and deciding to, to enter, to, to use a different gambit. And when one changes, you don't do it and demand that the other side make a concession to you. You do it to become more effective. We don't have influence in Cuba. We don't have contacts in Cuba. We have a lot of issues, those we mentioned here, the, the, the drug issue, the environmental issues, the fact that Cuba has a lot of uh, fugitives from U.S. justice, and we need to get into the game and, and start addressing those things. Thank to change you. the policy is to make a concession to ourselves. Thank you. Dr. Lee, last note. Yeah, well, I certainly... Uh I certainly agree with uh, General Caffrey and others that we need that we need to uh, that we need to uh, uh, engage the Cubans on uh, law enforcement, uh, intelligence uh, uh, issues of mutual concern. I did want to add something, just a couple of uh, uh, comments about the Cuban their internal drug control program, which has been highly successful, um, at least uh, according to the Cuban authorities themselves. Uh, when I was in Cuba last year, I, I talked to uh, one uh, Cuban medical professional, and he said that uh, between 1999 and 2003, the, uh, the price of a gram of cocaine increased from $15 a gram to $90 a gram. And he attributed this to a very, uh, you know, to a number of different policies, but probably uh, especially their laws, uh, which, uh, 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 in, 19, in, in 1988, uh, uh, the maximum penalty for drug abuse in Cuba, uh, rather for, for drug trafficking in Cuba, was 7 to 15 years in prison. Uh, today, the maximum penal penalty is 20 years to life. So what we're talking about here is a, is a regime which is, is really uh, very, very serious about controlling this problem. And I think, uh, you know, given their interest and given their concern, uh, I think that this uh, it makes a lot of sense for us to try to find some way to, to cooperate with them in some fairly creative ways. For example, we could, uh, we could conceivably um, even train Cuban border guards and Ministry of Interior operatives in, uh, in various areas of drug control. We could con conduct joint, joint naval patrols in the Caribbean with the Cubans. We could coordinate investigations of regional drug trafficking networks and, uh, and suspicious financial tra transactions going through Cuba. I mean, we could do a lot of different things. And I Thank think you. we have to uh, th talk about this even now, uh, even before the Castro brothers uh, leave the scene. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Mr. Pinon? Uh, 
I'm the only Cuban American in the panel. I'm an historico. I came here in 1960. Uh, my parents died in their 90s in Miami waiting to return to Havana tomorrow. I'm 61 today. Like the rest of my generation in Miami, at least the majority of my generation in Miami, we, Mr. Chairman, Cuban Americans, are willing to sit down and talk because we believe that the death of my parents wasn't necessary if we would have established conversations with Cuba a while back. Thank you. Thank you. Well, happy birthday and thank you for sharing your day with us. General, by virtue of your rank, you have the final word. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. You know, it's a great book, and I mentioned to your staff director, I think it was S.L.A. Marshall's Battles in the Monsoon. And it, uh, it's a, something I use talking about combat leadership. Young major commander, he's in a ferocious fight for two days. Uh, he continues in his own mind being engaged by the North Vietnamese Army, and they've gone for three days. And so I tell people, you know, you've got to watch you got to have a broader perspective than the immediate fight at hand. The American people, as Mr. Pignon has admirably said, have changed their view on how to deal with the Cuban regime. This is not serving our self-interest. Uh, this is the time to seize an opportunity and not let this drift along uh, for another two, two or three years. We've got a terrific uh, foreign policy team in office now, Se uh, Secretary Clinton. Uh, and others, uh, it's time to engage. So thank you again for the chance to be here and join this panel. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Flake and Mr. Delahunt, for your leadership on this issue, my colleagues on the panel. Thank all of you uh, for your testimony here today and sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thanks. It was his 58th birthday and his teenage